Hey guys, this week on Super for Good, I'm going to share with you a video of a recent session we had with the MLSA, the Master Landscapers Association of South Australia, where we spoke about waterproofing retaining walls. This was a great event. We had landscapers come in. They wanted to understand how they waterproof the grip set systems. We covered a whole lot of our solutions and things they need to be aware of. Enjoy this one. We'll have a, basically the presentation today is on retaining walls. I did say to Frank and Inca that we'd like to do a couple more this year on both planter box, garden beds and fish ponds and water features because they're big things and we've got a lot of experience in that area. But today the focus is on retaining walls. It's a common one for residential and commercial building and it's often a problem that you're going to see. And part of what Gripset's mantra is is about creating solutions for the industry. Okay, when you actually understand where waterproofing and the causes of issues are, after termites, canvas damage is still the largest cost to the Australian market in terms of damages. And this comes from our insurers. Okay, and it's a situation that's out of sight, out of mind a lot of the time. And only when you see things like we saw in Queensland recently with those floods and storms or when there's bushfires, do you find there's a greater cost than what we have a month to month issue in this country with millions of dollars that get spent on repairing damage damage. Um, and as I said, it's an issue that's out of sight, out of mind. And we don't see it or we choose not to see it. And, and the problem is that waterproofing as such is a unique trade. And it's not recognised as a trade like plumbing, like electrical, even you know, landscape. There's no, there's no apprenticeship that's done that way, unfortunately. So it gets bundled into different categories of trades. So we work with the likes of yourselves, we work with tilers, we work with the waterproofers that generalise out there and doing that. We work with plumbers, we work with some um, painters or particularly coating trades. But it is a trade that is, it, it does become complex because a lot of the times you don't see the waterproof finish. Unlike what you guys do out there and you finish the site off and it looks fantastic, a lot of our products are used to ensure that your work's not compromised. And that's, unless we're doing sort of external waterproofing with roofing or facades, very rarely the waterproof system is seen. And what you don't see is the key. And, and, that's, and that's where the integrity of, your, of the construction or the structure remains intact if it's done properly. And things we're going to go through today with retaining walls is where it actually comes unstuck. So retaining walls, I don't need to tell you guys what it is, but it's basically a wall that's designed to hold earth, hold back earth. That, that's the key of it. And as we know, all earth will contain moisture and hold moisture. And the key is what happens to retaining walls when they don't hold that moisture. And that's where the damage starts. The internal side of a basement wall, and you can see there's block work and there's concrete. And that's the common thing we see from retaining walls that go wrong, what the work that's been done on the outside. And when you're faced with this issue, sometimes you cannot get back out there This is the one we see often, you know, block work, common, still a common substrate to construct walls in this country with, a, with your uh, base footings and concrete slab. And at the bottom of the wall, the base of the wall where the head of the pressure is, where the water's draining, is where we see the entry of moisture into the, into the wall. And then you've got that efflorescence issue. And you can see in this situation here, they can't access that. And they're starting to batten out the wall to try and then put another wall surface on that. And it, you know, it creates a range of issues because you've got to try and get rid of mould and dampness and uh, mildew and, and we don't realise it because during the construction phase everyone just is in a rush to get it all done and then when it's time to actually have the finished um, construction in practice in service, these issues arise. And this is a common one we see, you know, where the, these effluorescent stains and moisture coming through and you're always putting like band-aid solutions on top. There are solutions we've got, and I'm going to go through that later in the presentation, but they never work as well as what they do when you can get it done right from the first time, before that earth is back foot up against the wall. And you know, Frank and I had a good chat yesterday, and we've seen from our experience over the years in the industry that there's numerous situations where these things are still not done right. And it's, it's all about the mindset of understanding what needs to happen and educating your builder, your client, and how you can go about doing it right. Now, these are ugly things, but they're just common carpets have to come up, floor, floor surfaces come up, it just creates a, a number of issues. And you know, when you talk about retaining walls where you can access a, a metre or so 
it's a little bit easier when you start to get these situations where they're buried underground or you've got an elevated site next door and a paved path has been uh, laid against it. It's you're dealing with always these issues as such. Anyone sort of seen these problems in the past with it, in your work? Hello, Frank. No. Okay, someone you do. All right. So retain wall failures. They basically all they do is become another damp statistic, and as I mentioned at the start. They create issues for the building structure because they actually, when you got dampness into those sorts of wall surfaces, even if this was an underground wall and we had to deal with dampness here, we might be able to sort of put a band-aid approach to cover that problem, but the moisture still getting into the structure, and you got still reinforcement and everything else that happens, where dampness will start to just slowly deteriorate that, that structure. So there are solutions you can put, probably called the negative side, if there was wall, if there was earth on the outside there, but it's never the same as what you can do from the positive side, where you actually stop moisture getting into it. It's, imagine a water tank. You don't waterproof a water tank from the outside. You line the tank from the inside. So where water comes in contact with the walls is a membrane, and that's how you get a treat a retain wall or, a, or a, what we call an envelope treatment around the perimeter of a home. And the thing is, it just sometimes it becomes an ongoing issue for years and years. The, some of those methods of trying to seal walls from the inside, you, it's, like I said, it's a bandit approach and you've got every four or five years you might need to be out there and doing other works because just other things pop up. But you, you can never do it the same as we can do it from the start. So hence today we're going to talk about retaining walls. And this is your basic retaining wall. Uh, drawing, is, this, is, this, is a, this detail hasn't changed for us for many years, but there's your retaining wall. And there's our earth that's uh, basically buried up against it. And I've just used, we've used the example of Ripset 51, which is one of our membranes, we'll go through our liquid membranes, but basically that gets applied to the wall surface. We have a bond breaker, which I'll talk about shortly, that goes to that joint. That is the most critical joint on a wall, where you've got your concrete footing and neither your first course of brick, because that is a joint. And that's where moisture capillary action will always find its way through there. And I'm sure many of you, if you've tackled retaining wall before, you never always get a nice footing that, that neat. But that really is the detail that counts the most. When you get that right, a lot of it goes forward from there. And then how you use your backfill. You know, you don't just put mud down there, using our drains, geotextiles, um, the right amount of drainage uh, matter that's down the bottom, and then you're putting earth and, and sand on top. And protection layers, protection boards, which we we'll go through as well, which uh, Impra board is the common, common one that's used out in the marketplace. Sometimes you might have a drainage cell that an architect, a landscape architect might specify. But that is a critical piece because where you have uh, a membrane and then you've got earth that gets backfilled against it, there's always the chance of damage. And the moisture gets, the, the membrane will be compromised. And all that work that's been done, which I'll show you some photos of, will then just create a leak and you only need a little pinhole for moisture to find its way through, particularly on the black wall. And some of those issues we saw will just start to happen from there. And that's your, that's your side detail there. So you can see what we call our elastic group joint band that's embedded inside our membranes. And there's your protection board, your board, ag drain situation, the membrane should go up to the height of the <coughs> and preferably a little bit higher than the backfill point where you can of surface finish on top, but we'll talk about that. So, we're going to go through the solutions in our business. Some of you might be familiar with these products, but we've got a, a couple different products in our range that you can use for retaining walls. And this product, Grips of 51, actually is our flagship product that many people still refer to bitumen in the state as Gripset. Uh, it's been around for a long time, it's actually where we started. But basically, it's a bitumen rubber membrane, it's a rollout type product that you can uh, roll onto any substrate. It's solvent free, non-hazardous, non-carcinogenic. Non uh, it sticks like the proverbial. There's not much that doesn't stick if you haven't used it before. So it's got outstanding adhesion properties. And it's not just bitumen, it's actually got a polymer to it. So that means that when it dries, it can handle constant moisture. Okay, and so very popular for retaining walls. I mean, I think anyone that does their apprenticeship in underground walls, normally the first thing people tell you is to use the black stuff and they're referring to a bitumen product and this is where the Grips of 51 product has been very popular in, in Australia for the fact that it was the first to market 
that started that water-based technology. So it's not flammable, there's no hazardous odours. So sometimes you could be in a retaining wall application where you've got a very limited work area uh, between a, a wall and a, um, a trench. You've got no hazardous fumes coming from these products that we've, that we've got. And that's a really important part of our research and development what we make. And if there's any questions while we're going along, guys, just raise your hand and I'll kind of address them. Gripset C1P. This is um, a product that we are now referring to as probably our best product for underground applications. And the reason we push this product is because it's a product that's a powder that you add water to it and it creates a, a membrane that you can roll out, basically. Um, it has a high build property to it. It can bond to damp surfaces, which is really important. Dries fairly quickly, so if you've got walls where in the winter time where they don't get much sun, it will still cure because it has the cement hydrates, so it'll dry. And more importantly is that when, and we'll show some photos later, when you have your membrane that finishes at the top of a wall that might exceed the height of the earth line, this product is really good to enable renders or texture finishes to go directly over it or paints. That's the problem with pitch mode, unfortunately, with our grips if you want. You then got to put another preparation coat on top. But with this sort of product, it allows you to finish on top of it quite easily. Without getting too technical, you'll see on the label, it talks about positive and negative pressure. This product can actually be used inside a water tank. It will hold water. That's how water it is. But if you had a situation, like we showed those photos before, where there's a negative, like you might be on the inside of a basement, it can actually be used on that side as well. But we promote this always on the positive side. And it's the sort of product that just the trade really enjoy using because it, whether you've got hot weather or cooler weather, it trows out, rolls out really easy. And it's, um, there's no primer. I mean, Alex, is, this is really one of the products you train guys on most, Alex, for external application. Yeah. Right? So yeah, uh, and um, you can increase the, the, the film coverage as you need. So if you've got a specification where you're not you might need to put an extra coat or you will need to build it out further. You might see sometimes our specifications might require a thicker film than normal. You can just put another coat on it. It does give you that body. And it covers those pores in, on block work really well because the sand in it actually fills the pores inside a porous block work or a pitted um, precast concrete or poured concrete. Excuse me, Phil, but sure. also you, you let them know too, it's UV stabilised. Yeah, so it's, it's, brilliant. it's got good UV resistance as well. So. And that's what the bitumen doesn't do, you're right there, Frank. The bitumen oxidizes over time. This product, we don't market this as a roof membrane, but if it's exceeding the earth line and it's exposed to weather, it won't break down. And uh, that, that's the biggest part of the job. Grips in 2P, this is, it works very similar to the C1P. It's a two part, where you have a liquid and a powder. The difference between this and the C1P is that it's a lot more flexible. And this was a product that we actually, this also is a proof of potable water and water tanks that can handle uh, underground conditions. But the reason we, we actually had this product on the market before we developed the C1P. So a lot of the trades still love going back to this product because they know it. And they also can use it for a, a range of applications just like that flexibility. If you've got maybe hairline shrinkage cracks on a wall, this would be your go-to product potentially because it's got a bit more flexibility. Um, but again, it's, it's fast drying, compatible with renders and paints and uh, all types of finishes. It won't, it won't bleed like through the finish line you might get with a bitumen. And um, it will bond to a damp substrate. It doesn't dry as quick as the C1P, it still dries fairly fast. But it is a, a probe that you can confidently use and know that once it's there, it'll continue to dry because when you've got anything that's cement based, it's got to keep hydrating to, to cure. Whereas the Gripsa 51, being that one component of bitumen uh, polymer, in the winter months you can find that if you've got cold weather, it can stay wet for a few days. It will take longer to cure. These products, the C1P and the 2P, will cure quicker, and that's really what you want. Because a lot of the times with the retaining walls, they're going to get buried a few days after you finish your job. The elastic proof joint band. I've shown you this product here, and I'm. Uh, few photos on it, but this is our, um, you might have heard the term bond breaker that needs to be used when you're waterproofing. 
Now, you, if you go back to that drawing I had where I showed the joint between the footing and the first course of brick, a lot of people just, you know, back in the day we used to use fiberglass embedded in between things like grips of 51. But the problem with that is it's rigid and you lose the flexibility. This is a joint man that um, it's elastic. So it has what we call elastic recovery and it's already waterproof. So moisture won't get through that. So if there's any rupture or movement, this will accommodate that. And we use it, it's, it's, it's our religion. We use it in every membrane that we have um, for immersed areas, roofing, retaining walls, the whole lot. And we can use it in all those products. Grips of 51, C1P, 2P. Works really well and really easy to use. You just embed it in between the coats of the, the membrane, which is some photos to show that. But the, the primary piece of the flexible bond breaker is that it has that elastic recovery. It's such an important part of a bond breaker. Our competitors use a bead of sealant. Well, they must might put a bit of silicon or polyurethane. The problem with that is that when you then paint your membrane over the top, it's not always compatible. And you can't compare a bead of sealant to that elastic band there. That's a 60 mil piece of rubber that will waterproof it and, and handle that elastic recovery. And that is the key. And it's the speed of application too. It just allows you to keep flying on. And with that, we've got elastic corners, which that comes up more so for, you might have some retaining walls where you have a return. So instead of trying to detail in the corners, you've got, um, you can't have a look at these after, but these are prefabricated elastic corners that are used with that joint band. And so if you've got a, a wall return, an outside wall return, or an internal wall, you can use that and then the, the <coughs> joint band just overlaps that area and, and continues on. We always sell systems. We don't just sell products. So what you're seeing today is a system that can work from virtually the footing right through to the, the, the uh, protection layer they're going to put down. And then you take care of all, immediately where the areas break down. Your footing areas, your penetrations is often where waterproofing breaks down. So there's some photos of the, the products that I just spoke about. So that's our Grip C51 product that you, it's still the common one that's, that many guys like to use out there. Um, so you've seen there's the footing down there and the elastic proof joint band would have been embedded in there. You actually don't see it afterwards, but it's embedded into the coats. And there it is being laid. So you can see as it's embedded into the coats of the groups of 51. And that could be the same with the cementitious coat and the C1P or the 2P. But you just wet the fabric edge into the membrane and it sticks to the wall and that goes over that joint all the way along. If it was a square return at the base with the footing, you just form that 90 degree angle. Very simple to apply um, and it's done. We're, no wait, we're not waiting for skillness to dry, we're not waiting for things to set off. You just keep the job going along. That is the most important piece, that's the most important detail of the retaining wall. You can put your membrane on as good as you like from base to, to the top, but if you haven't got that detail right, you are really hoping that it's going to work. And then once it's buried, it's a long way down to try and work out how to fix it. So these are, you know, where, where do um, membranes terminate? That's a, that's a key point. So, you know, you get steel bars that are coming out the wall. It's, it's really important when you're doing jobs with builders that you understand and ask these questions to start with. Sometimes we've seen guys do really good work and then they've gone higher than what the client wants and the client wants a face brickwork left. And they're then stuck with the cost of having to grind or remove the membrane because they've gone too far. So it's important to understand that you have to, oh, sorry. it's important to understand where the line's going to go and what's going to happen and ask that question with your client first up. No different than if you're a painter was painting the bathroom and he's, he's virtually going to know he's, he's, he's finishing the door, door level and you just draw a line. You don't need to get a tape line but you need to understand where that's going to be so you don't get caught out with going too high or too low. One of our applicators in Adelaide just loves caking on, that's the Grip C51 just caked on like leather. And um, just to be fully secure. And that's where the C1P now is, uh, is applied. And that's the C1P cementitious coating. You can see the way this has been done. So that footing down the bottom is protected. Behind that is that elastic proof joint band. And it's gone right up to that wall termination point. And C1P, it's very forgiving because of the fact that you just can get that body and build to it. And uh, a lot of the professionals like using it for that reason. You can get your second coat on a lot quicker as well, which is the, the, another important piece. There's a photo that um, is one that you need to be aware of as well. So 
I, I include this photo because sometimes a control joint or a movement joint will be incorporated into the wall. And you need, you can't just bridge it with a membrane. So that's where the joint band, the elastic joint band, can also be used vertically because it's got the elastic recovery. And so at the wall floor junction has been put in, but then you come along and you then overcoat that again, you ground through that, and you put that through, and then you can seal over the top of it. But if you just left that job and just tried to coat it with a membrane, a liquid membrane, obviously the first bit of movement is going to split. Even if someone wants to put a foam rod or get fancy with a silicon bead, you put the elastic joint band in there and it actually allows for that contraction expansion. It works with the way construction is designed to move. And that's the key piece. What sort of width can you go with that? Yeah, good question. So that, that movement joint there, uh, that'll take joints from 5 to 10 mil, and if you've got a movement joint that's going to open up more than 5 mil, then it becomes an expansion joint. We've got a thicker version, we've got a grade called our XP, which is designed for expansion joints. I don't know whether with retaining walls we see joints moving more, even when we've got precast, um, and they're filled with the sealant, they're still not designed to move more than that, that 5 mil capacity. But it's a good question because if you ever come up against an expansion joint, you should always ask what the starting width is and what the expected movement is going to be, and then you can accommodate that. And if you ever get stuck with that, our technical service department have got the, the specifications to help guide you along on what you can use there. This is the Grip Set 2P, uh, which was the other cement based membrane I mentioned before. So you can see it's a lighter colour, and it is um, basically. Again, elastic proof at the base, comes up to the, the top of the wall there, and this is a great product if they're going to render over that wall or paint over it, but the, the, more importantly, when the protection layer comes onto it after, very um, easy to apply the protection board on, on top of it. Um, and it's really just, this is the more flexible uh, membrane in the range we've got, but again, it dries quickly. And it's really a matter of preference between this one and the C1P these days we find. And you can see the way it's, again, just used there and it's finished that, that top of that wall before the starter bars are in there for the, for the next slab that's going to go on top. You know, and it doesn't matter whether you've got curved walls or straight walls. In this situation here, the elastic proof joint bands are in that base there, along here, and would go into that vertical corner as well. Those vertical corners there, always dangerous because it looks like it's nice and dry now. When that's buried, those sorts of corners just suck up moisture. Capillary action just sucks it up. And that's the piece that you want to make sure you've got more than just a liquid membrane there. And that's where that joint band in the corner will give you that extra protection. And it's just really good common sense to, to show your client you're doing that. This is the, I use this photo because you're going to see some photos later of where jobs have actually failed because of this hasn't been done. But one of the big problems with block walls is that the brickies, as many of you would know, um, they, on the external side, if they know that it's going to be backfilled or it's actually not going to be seen, the joints aren't flushed off and there's voids. And so even though our membranes, like the C1P and 2P, go to block work really easily and fill the voids up with the sand, it's the joints, the perp joints, that create the issues. And sometimes you'll see that the membrane will get sucked up, you try and bridge it, and it, it, it comes and, and backfires on it, which I'm going to show you a, a case study of what we had a few years ago with a customer. And it was a big cost on it. it was a big issue. But the, 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 the most important thing is, is to face fill those joints. You could give it a skin coat or a slurry coat, which we'll show, but you can't just leave gaps and joints open. You need to fill them up if they're not flushed off. So you can see here they've flushed them off and then the C1P has been applied. And over these pipes are those large collars to seal around that. And that's the way it needs to be done. Otherwise, the risk is you're going to have a membrane that will just suck up into those holes and creates a hole. And then you're going to get um, water just pushing through inside that, that cavity and then it creates all those issues we saw earlier. Retaining wall failures. And sometimes this, this still happens when, when walls are waterproof. And then why, is that, why does that happen? So I showed you that photo before where you've got block wall, solid basement concrete, and water ingress coming through. And this is the issue that 
I want to show you where we've had jobs where they have failed even when they've been waterproof. Now that is the C1P membrane. And what's happened here? Does anyone know what that is? Void. Yeah, that's, so that's the void in the, in the block work. So instead of actually filling that void, the guy thought, I'll just keep putting on the membrane as thick as I can. And it was like leather. It was just, you know, you, you could have cut maybe three or four mil of that membrane out. But the problem is there's suction, and that, that just sucks up the membrane, creates a small hairline crack, and that's enough for moisture to go through. Yeah. Where the snotty bits have been in, in block work, where the bricklayers have, um, someone's, like, they've hit the dags off, but then they've left the holes underneath it, and again, just tried to bridge it with the membrane. You can see a classic there, where it's, you know, there the, the perp joint's filled, there it isn't. They've just tried to do the same everywhere. And it's, when they left that job, it all looked level. When he's going through the drying and curing process, 24 foot hours later, it just gets sucked into that point. And there you've got the hairline cracking phenomenon ha happening. And that issue has just all begun stuff. And you'll see what they had to do after. And then that's all you need for uh, the dampness to start on a major project where it just that's what you see on the outside. What happens on the inside, it could spread along the whole length of that wall like that. Because the problem is when you get a leak to detect, very rarely is where the leak is, is where what you see is where the water's coming from. And you're trying to find a needle in the haystack. So the leak might be here, but it could be coming from meters down that wall. And that's the hairline cracking as well, because if you actually put a membrane on, membranes aren't designed to go on three or four mils thick in one coat. So they just try and hurry the job up and get it happening and that shrinkage cracking happens on that joint, on that gap, and that's where the failure point is. So what you have here, this wall was four metres deep and it was a fairly high-end home of a pro prominent architect. And unfortunately, uh, and the architect wanted this product, wanted the system, and the applicator thought, I'll just put the extra two or three coats on of the membrane to get it where it needs to be. So one was that they had all those voids that were done incorrectly. The other one was that when they had put the Forticon plastic up against it, it wasn't sealed against the wall. And what happened was, earth started getting behind the plastic and the membrane. Then what happens is the wall gets backfilled and the pressure from the earth starts to push stones and rocks into these voids and damages the membrane. And so, like I said before, the system needs to seal the whole area. So, not just the waterproofing, it's how they terminate that forticon and their protection layer afterwards, which we'll show you. But this is what actually had to happen here, at that, because what had happened on the inside of this wall, it wasn't going to be, it was a feature brickwork. The architect did not want it to be rendered. And he actually wanted this, this concrete, block to be seen as a special concrete block. And before that even started pouring the slab and, and building upstairs, there was this, these damp stains coming inside. And this was in the middle of winter, and June, July, which, you know, Murphy's Law, and shit is everywhere, and they had to pull it all out. And the contractor had to pay for all, and this is around the whole perimeter of the home, um, four metres deep. Excavate that out, backhoe it out, start again, get down to the footing. The architect wanted to go down to the footing, and rightly so, to check where it was coming from. And that's where we detected it from, from the base up. They put the elastic rib joint band everywhere, correctly, but it was all these high points. And normally guys think, oh, up high, there's less risk there. It's all down the bottom. That is not the case. And so, you know, when you start to do this investigating work, you uncover this mess. And for probably a half a day's labor of preparing that wall, first up and filling those voids, even right off as a day, it would have saved them a week plus all the costs of all the other trays to, to get that happening, yes. What's the best product to fill those voids? Is it, are you able to just use a silicon and then like pre-membrane and then? You yeah, know, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what our preparation price after. Right. Um, silicon is a no-no, never do that. Uh, because the fact is with silicon, I was saying to Frank before, and those sealants you find, they're not compatible with your membranes. And so you don't get adhesion. It's a real simple application. It's really a cement-based mortar uh, with an additive in there that fills it. But yeah, you've, you've, you've got to fill it with something solid as well. So here's, in contrast, how the Forticon has been, after the membrane's been put down, the Forticon's been 
neatly closed in, put in place, and ready to be terminated before the, the protection layer goes on. And, and Frank and I will show you uh, one of our methods later on, on what we do there. You can see all around the perimeter of the wall, all done properly. These membranes we put in to the right height, the photocon comes in, and this is the input board, the protection layer that's going to be cut and prepared, ready to go. So that's got the photocon in place for the egg drain to sit on it. The protection layer will go on top of that. And really, we'd probably like to see that they extend out further. But in this case, they've been working their trench. That's all the area they had to work on. So it was the best they've got. But this is the point that's important, where that gets sealed up the top, and how you terminate that over that cavern. Very important detail. Because all that good work you might have done with a membrane can be compromised just from a little slip up like that. So going back to that, um, going back to that job that uh, we're all the, the shit at the fan. When they got it right, they came back and they put the protection layer and they went to the extent of putting pressure seals, which normally for a job like this, you wouldn't need to put those sorts of pressure seals. But that was the extreme they went to because once bit twice shy, and around a perimeter of the home like that, only that pressure seal there probably cost the same as probably waterproofing one of those walls. You know, in, in, in materials and, and labour. It was, it was a fairly expensive practice, but there was no risk taken after that. And you can see all that blue tape, that's actually taping up the joints of the protection <coughs> wall, because they butt joint together to ensure you don't get any rocks and earth sort of coming through those as well. You can see it down there. And so that's where the soil wasn't going any higher than that because then they were landscaping outside this before they started brick laying up on top. So any questions on, on, on that stuff at all before we move on? Okay. So some of our other grip set solutions that we've got. So I've spoken about um, how retaining walls are going from what we call the positive side on the outside of the wall. I'm just going to quickly talk about there are solutions sometimes that you need for negative pressure because you might be asked to fix a job for a client that's got a retaining wall problem and you can't access the outside and the solutions we've got, the repairs and no access from the positive side and also stopping active leaks. So we've got a water-based epoxy primer which with epoxies they've got really good resistance against negative pressure. So in, we don't use this very often on the outside of the wall but this is a retaining wall and you've got a basement area that had the effluents in there, been cleaned up, they couldn't access that outside, and they could put this product on the inside of the wall. And that stops that, that moisture coming through. Now, is it stopping the moisture getting to the wall? No. But it's stopping the signs of the moisture. At the end of the day, you can't give a guarantee like that because it's, you're never actually stopping the moisture getting to the wall, but you are stopping the efflorescence and the dampness and the, and the mould coming into that wall through that because you, you provide a vapour barrier. And that's about the best you can, you can do in that situation. Well, things like a water plug, I'm not sure if you're familiar with water plugs, but if you've got dampness, if you've got a wall that's really actively leaking, we see this sometimes in elevator shift, uh, lift um, pits and cellars where you might have got a head of water and there's a, there's a crack in the, or, or water coming through one of the joints of the block work. You can't just, you, you literally are seeing water pour out. You can't just use a membrane. You need to use a water plug first, to what we call plug it. And then you could use one of the products like a C1P on top of that. And these are solutions that are there for you that if you ever confronted with that, our technical services department can help you with that. Um, and this is the product that I have mentioned to Frank before. This is the Grips 11Y, that it's, a, it's an additive that no tradie should not have in their van. It works with anything that's got cement in it. So going back to your question then about filling up the voids, this product is that potent that if I mix that with cement, uh, with cement I can get it to bond the glass. You never use it neat, really, it, but you can dilute it with water three or four to one, or up to five parts to one, uh, one with water and then you can add it into a cement mortar to fill those voids in the preparation. But what it does, it stops the shrinkage of anything that's cement based. It gives it really high adhesion, it gives it water resistance, and gives it good crack resistance as well. And use anything like a render, a screed, a repair mortar, a grout, uh, even some of the tile adhesives. You can, in some of our tile adhesives, we use this as an additive in there to make it more waterproof for things like pools. But it's a product that's it's, it's got great usage. Um, Frank and I were talking before about PVA, you know, 
the old SEM stick that many uh, contractors used to use by name many, many years ago. It's PVA. PVA is art and craft for it. It mixes with cement. There should never be an area where cement's going to be with water. It'll break down. This product, we can actually put it inside a swimming pool, a water tank, continuously immersed, and it won't break down to water. And that's what you need when you're having that additive in cement. And it gives you nice working properties as well. And there's the man himself, Alex, putting uh, the, the, that's the Gripsy 11 Y slurry. <coughs> and he's getting that wall prepared. You can see that's the preparation piece. And they come around, they put the slurry down, which seals up all the, the voids, and then they'll come and fill up these voids before they go and put a membrane on the wall. It fills up even on, on, uh, on your clay brick. And it's a product that guys really like because it just, it's, it's a safeguard. It, it, um, it fills up anything, like th this wall is actually pretty well prepared. You can see the joints are pretty well prepared. And the guy's still using this as a slurry primer, just as a precaution before he goes and puts the joint band in the bottom. And on top of that, he could put any of our cementitious membranes, the C1P or the 2P, or he could put the Gripsy 51 on it if he wanted to. But that, that's someone that knows what they're doing. Renders, you can see there's a slurry, and then it's a waterproof render. There's a car park below that. So the single cavity wall, and basically they were putting a waterproof render on top before they painted it, and the Gripsy 11 way of is in that. Very thin build, gives you waterproof properties. And that, that's, that's the beauty of it. And it gives you a really nice workability. So when you've used it, it, it actually gives a plasticizing effect to, to the sand cement. That Does you it affect drying time? It actually helps the drying time because you're reducing the water content. So um, yeah, it's slightly quicker. Now, butyl tape, Frank, did you want to talk a bit about this with the, the detail we spoke about earlier? And there we go. So butyl tape. Um, is our, it's a self-adhesive tape that we, butyl rubber is not like bitumen, it actually um, will bond anything like plastic on any sealed surface. And when you saw that detail before with the Forticon uh, up on the wall. Could you, got that, could you go back to that part? Yeah, sure. Okay, so that, that <coughs> detail there. We use on this is actually our wall, but we use it to finish up up here. And this is uh, very, very important as Phil's already said. If you get any properties like screenings behind there, you get any dirt, and it just traps moisture. It, and then you're going to have an issue with, in, in, at the front of the wall. We use this to finish it off with. So we usually put, in this case, we use 51, then we use uh, Forticon, and the Umpra board. That's our system, how we do it. But we use this to finish it off, always. And then from there, we make sure this is covered with the actual infra board, so it stabilizes and it doesn't break down. That's how we put it. I think it's absolutely critical. If you put all of these systems in place, you won't have an issue. You won't have an issue. You spoke about that uh, additive before with that 11Y. 11, 11 Using that in the actual render, you can use it in the actual mixture when you're laying your blocks. You could put it probably in your cavity as well. It's not a PVA glue that they use in kindergarten, believe me. That stuff goes off like anything, and it's important to use in your cavity as well. That would help. All of these procedures save you coming back. There's an old saying, you do it once, you do it right, or there's no right way to do the wrong way. If you just put these little measures in place, you'll be fine. You'll be absolutely fine. And All the, of these things will go away. Yeah. The nature of the butyl rubber, the butyl is actually waterproof. Yeah. And so the fabric that we've got on that facing can be finished over the render or the texture or the cementitious or our membranes. Or they could lay more concrete on top. And if it's going to be left exposed, you just use one of our membranes over the top of it. But you know, try and, if you ever tried to bond even silicon to plastic fortifying, you can just peel it off afterwards. This won't, this won't separate from plastics like that or the import, so it bonds very well. We often see even, a lot of times we see duct tape put over the top. That's a waste of time. You know, that's a complete waste of time. Do it right and then you're sweet. It, really, we do a lot of these walls. Most of us will do all of these walls. Very common, everywhere. So if you do all of that systems, put your egg drain in, do your bottom seal tape, do the top one, it's all completely sealed. The Emperor board protects the Forticon, and the Forticon, of course, will protect the 51 or your C1P, whichever one you want to use. 
your call. Thanks, Frank.